I think they're live. So that time you dosed the company? <laughs> All right. I, Hello. So are, we are we live now, George? We are live. We are live. Welcome, everybody, to a very special, it's like I grew up with in the world of broadcast TV, and every like Christmas episode was a very special episode of <laughs> Guy Kubernetes, episode 100. And, uh, and we decided to do something a little bit different this time around where we collected all the hosts and uh, put them in boxes uh, up on a screen. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, we're gonna do a little bit of a sort of live panel, hanging out, uh, you know, talking to each other type of thing. So let's, you know, let's do a quick round of introduction. So I'm Joe, I'm the, um, uh, I'm a principal engineer at VMware. Uh, uh, one of the folks who helped get Kubernetes started. And uh, I started TGIK, you know, quite a while. I don't even know when the first episode was. I don't know. It was day drinking with Joe. On the Ooh, trivia question. First, uh, yeah. first t-shirt giveaway, actually. Yep. First person to give us the date of the first TGIK will win a Tanzu t-shirt that Joe is wearing. Yeah, Here's this is our Tanzu t-shirt. They will win the t-shirt that Joe is wearing. No, you heard it. No. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, I'm watching the chat here. But okay, so while we're, while we're waiting on that, like, uh, Nova, why don't you go next and introduce yourself? Hey, everyone. Uh, I am hanging out in my cloud native computing hoodie and sweatpants. I just got back home. I've been at the hospital since about 6 a.m. Uh, so yeah, I made it in time for TGIK, and I figured what, what a great opportunity for me to see everyone and uh, share some of the, uh, the exciting after effects of my time at the hospital earlier today. But uh, just a quick update, I'm doing fine. We're trying to figure out some stuff that's been going on with me and just something unexpected happened and I'm back and it looks like everything's taken care of. And also uh, I have two very important people with me who took me to the hospital earlier today here in the room that are gonna be hanging out and they're gonna probably be making some some comments as we go you got, forward. You got a local the peanut banter. gallery there. Yeah. Yeah, the peanut gallery. It's a uh, Holden Caro and Ava. Hello. All right. So George, it looks like the the first one I see is well, it had June thirtieth, twenty seventeen. Is that? Who the met? Was it Walid? Walid. Okay, we can't hear a George. That's because he's muted. Sorry, I'm muted. So Walid got it first there. He just beat Lamadi there. June 30th, 2017 is the first time he decided to do this. Awesome. Are, are we going right. to go through and, and call out people in the chat like we, we Yeah, I, I want to say, okay, who wants to do that? Who's, who's looking at the chat? I'll, I'll say hi to, let's see, I'm going to start at the top. So we have Linux Raza saying hi early on. Faz 9600, Rory from uh lock goil head i love that we keep trying to say that word you know like only right. rory can say that word like <laughs> Paris. Uh, i was asking about nova like alexandre lamati who's like i don't think has missed a single episode i don't think so either yeah uh carrie joe from russia joe from atlanta bogdan Martin from the Netherlands, Suresh, VMware IT Academy from Costa Rica, Alvaro, um, okay, welcome, welcome. David, Amira from Tunisia. So, you know, I, I really appreciate you all hanging out with us on your like late night, early morning, because again, mm -hmm. like, you know, this is the worst time to host something like this. Uh, Bogdan uh, is in Bucharest. Uh, Carlicia, how's it going down in San Diego? I think that's where you're at, right, Carlicia? So, yeah, awesome. Good to see y'all. All right, so let's keep going. So, so Duffy, why don't you do a quick intro? So I'm Duffy. I'm a staff cloud native architect at VMware, and I'm, you know, I I think I I can't actually remember when my first episode was. That might be another awesome like uh, trivia question. That'd be a harder one to figure out. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I've been doing this for a little while now. I've got a, I've got I've been doing a series called Grokking TGIK, and I've really been enjoying that. Um, like as we go through the names in the chat, seeing you all like, you know, tune in to us every week is one of the things that I think amazes all of us, if I could speak for all of us for just a moment, is how we have an audience that spans the globe. I mean, there are people 
around the world who are like tuning into this, which always blows my mind. So thank you all for being here again for the hundredth. Yay. Yay. I still remember uh, when we were sitting in the Heptio office, Duffy, and it was like me and Joe, and we were both going through and just kind of being like, so we, we kind of just do this with OBS and it just kind of works and teaching you what little bit of trivia we, we had to uh, get you started. Mm -hmm. That was fun. I ended up having to compile it from my little, my poor meager Intel video card. <laughs> That's right, I remember you had to recompile it to get running. <laughs> yes. uh, All right, let's keep going. So Brian, I'm, I'm going around sort of the, the rotation on mine here. Hello, um, I've only done one um, episode of TGIK on a Friday. I mean, um, I have a great crew that does all the rest of them, but I've done two live ones. So um, thank you all for including me, even though I've given absolutely the minimum effort to be here. Well, but you've also, yeah, the live ones I think are great. And like, we want you to do more. We're gonna be roping you in, don't worry, man. <laughs> you know, it's like, you can't say no now. <laughs> I've been recruiting amongst all of the many new hires in the field engineering team also. So I feel like I've got a few, a few, a few good bites. So we might be getting some new hosts soon. And then Christian. All right, uh, can you hear me? Does this work? Yes, loud and clear. All right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Christian. Uh, I'm a principal engineer at VMware, um, new to Kubernetes. Well, I was a year ago. I guess it's a year already. Um, and um, I've only done one episode, but uh, I, I itch to make more. Turns out you need a lot of bandwidth and a really good gear, and I don't have it. So I don't only get to do it when I'm in the office in Palo Alto, and it just didn't work out afterwards. So I'm hoping in the new year I will you know, be on here more. Uh, this is fun. And exciting yeah, we'll, and we'll definitely find some room for you to everything. do more um yeah and christian's a, a nomad uh based out of germany but really anywhere <laughs> awesome Fact. so if y'all if y'all ever get like a good gear setup really dialed in let us know because i had some folks come up to me and ask like what's the best way to do a production uh remotely like at a conference or at a hotel or something it's hard the 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 doing this stuff at like a hotel, super, super hard. The bandwidth's never, I mean, like, dude, even having a Zoom call at a hotel is always it, yeah. Even Airbnb has been has been terrible because just the bandwidth requirement, the, the, the setups, having enough screens and everything, it's uh, like in the office, it worked out, but uh, anywhere else I tried just didn't work. Hmm. All right, so I'm looking at the chat here and uh, hello to a bunch of other folks, uh, Joy and David and, Antonia, uh, and yeah. Um, and then Walid says that Duffy looks like his first was on August 24th, 2018. Um, oh, and we were gonna do a gong, but like, I don't think we got our act together and got a gong, uh, unfortunately. Um, nope. Yeah, that's what we imagine. There was here, but there wasn't one. Yeah, we are gonna try and make it happen, but uh, I don't, I think we, uh, we missed it. And then Alexandra is asking if there's beers in the virtual, there is. But I'm doing like the keto thing, right? Yeah, now. don't uh, don't go into the fridge. We have a whole section on Joe's beverage. Yeah, yeah, beverage fridge. Um. <laughs> All right, Josh. Hey, what's up, everyone? Um, I'm Josh. Similar to Duffy, I I work in the field helping people be successful building platforms and things like that on top of Kubernetes. Um, I've been kind of like the filler person as well between Duffy and Joe in the early days. I actually tried to do a TGIK pretty early. Duffy was helping me out. I was also having to recompile OBS, but we quickly found out that my uh, one megabit per second upload speed was just not going to fly. Um, but eventually I moved into a place that's not in the middle of nowhere and now I can stream things. So that's kind of a cool thing. Um, so yeah, stoked to be here with everybody. Good to see you, Josh. And then finally like, George. I... So so George has never done a TGIK, but he's done a lot of TGIKs. So yeah. George is, is often behind the scenes helping make this stuff run. Uh, and so I'm, I'm glad that we're getting you on screen now. Yes, and today I will be giving away tons of t-shirts. So the way it's gonna work is every 10 minutes or so, or at any host discretion, I'll be giving away a t-shirt or so. And then I am putting my Twitter handle and email address in the chat. 
And after we mention that you want a shirt, just let me know, and then we will ship out the fabulous t-shirt that Joe is modeling for you today. Our first two winners are going to be Waleed, since he figured out where what the first episode was, and David, who says that his first watching, uh, David Michael says uh, he was watching TGIK while his daughter was being born, and she's three now. Two, yes, I, I remember watching Joe on TGIK from the hospital when my daughter was born. She's two now, so David Michael, you've definitely earned a t-shirt. I, I from hope me. I wasn't on while the actual <laughs> event was happening. Yeah, yeah. I hope that's what Please yeah. say that wasn't the case. Yeah. What what do you tell your family in that case? It's like, hold on, I'm learning about operators. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Is the kid named after that TGIK episode? Yeah, yeah. What did you name your daughter? Yeah. Happy birthday, Helm. <laughs> name your kid yaml <laughs> no yeah so pe so Joe, people, people, people that it would be good <laughs> people are asking yep so people are asking what the what the format's going to be for the show so real quick we'll cover it we're going to cover the news and instead of just having one person cover the news you're going to get opinions on the news uh from that and then i've got a pre-selected set of questions and also the audience as well feel free like there's got to be some burning questions you have about how TGIK is put together or Joe's favorite bourbon or what exactly is in Joe's fridge. Uh, so feel free to start typing those in the chat along with where you're from, and then we will start the conversation. So Joe, All right, you so the, way, the, news? the way that I want to make this thing work is um, what I'll do is um, I'll call on one of the hosts on there, and then you can pick one of the items off the off the thing here and i'll click on the link and then you can talk about it and then we'll just rotate around until we've gone through all these items and if if you want to talk about something that's not on the list feel free to like add it <laughs> so we can awesome. actually do that uh to start with so i'm going to start with george which one do you want to i'm going to do the cover? i'm going to do the save the date for the kubernetes contributor summit since i sent that email okay um, yeah, so uh, the day before KubeCon Cloud NativeCon, traditionally there's a Kubernetes Contributor Summit. This is divided into two tracks, one for new contributors and one for current contributors. So if you're interested in starting your contribution journey to Kubernetes, you can sign up for the new contributor workshop. You'll bring your laptop, you know, you'll open it up. We have little instructions <laughs> for you. You'll figure out how to learn GitHub, how the repos are organized and all the good stuff that you need to learn. So that's a save the date. Next week we'll have on this Kubernetes dev mailing list, we'll have more information on how you can register and all that good stuff. And this is part of the effort of getting more. Oh, wait, what you can say, Duffy? This is part of the effort of getting more people involved, right? I remember there was a big push right before um, uh, North America uh, KubeCon this year, where we were really trying to reach out to people like like everybody, try to get everybody involved, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's awesome. All right. So let's go back. So that one's done. OK, let's do. Uh, Josh, why don't you pick one next? Sure, I'll take uh, Kubernetes meet needs more tech writers. So right. um, this one's kind of near and dear to my heart because we're we're bringing a lot of people onto our team right now, and it, it seems like one of the areas that you know you know if you're not not that people on our team necessarily can't write code, but if you, if it, you want an entry point that's different than just the typical like development standpoint, Sig Docs and the Docs group is really interested in bringing more people on to help do technical writing, right? For all kinds of personas, like me, especially as someone who does typically write a lot of code, I'm super interested in doing this in 2020. Sig Docs has been on my agenda just because like, I wanna be better at stating or articulating technical concepts that's readable by everybody, right? So you should definitely check this out and get involved with the Sig, especially if you're looking for like a solid entry point into the Kubernetes ecosystem. So I, I put this, you know, oh, I'm sorry, Duffy, I interrupted you again, man. <laughs> all good, you go first. So I think you know the the one of the interesting things here is that I think part of what we're trying to do with the Kubernetes community as a whole is we value all the people that are contributing to the community, regardless of whether it's code or docs or helping to run meetings or helping to do releases. There's all sorts of ways for folks to roll up their sleeves and get involved. And I think this is one of those. Um, and so you know there are some open source communities that are like if you're not writing code, you don't matter. Well, that's not the way we operate. That's not how we roll. And, and can I just say, like, it's amazing. The I probably three times a day I Google Kubernetes something, and you know the official documentation always pops up and answers my questions. So, like, 
I don't even know which docs I'm missing at this point because it's been awesome. So uh, thank you to anybody watching who's actually contributed. So I put this one on the list actually. Um, and the reason I put it there was because there was actually a big Twitter exchange recently about um, kind of user experience uh, that, are, that is somewhat counter to Christian's experience. Um, and I think it's, you, you benefit from actually knowing what questions to ask sometimes, but a lot of people don't really have that, <clears throat> don't know what questions to ask and they run into trouble. So what has what surfaced from this is that there are very few people, very few entities out there that are, um, you know, actively contributing to to docs, and we need more of them. And so that's why I was raising it. It was because we just a, it's a call to action. You know, like if you work for if you work for an organization that is working heavily with Kubernetes, and and you feel like there's an opportunity for you to um, either contribute to docs or even just you know, promote that within your company, please do so. We need more people on, we need more tech writers on SIG docs. <laughs> so what Leeds asking, so how, how, how the, how it all works, do we have to read code to find out which docs need to be written? Um, how, you know, concretely, how can folks get started? Definitely go to the SIG docs page that I linked in the, in the notes, right? They, just like every other SIG, do have a, do have a meeting where they, where they get together and chat about what's happening in there. Um, they will also have labels within the TGI or within the TGIK repo, within the Kubernetes repo that are um, going to be things like um, good first issue or needs, needs, uh, you know, those sorts of things. But if you just want to reach out and, you know, volunteer some time and ask people like how you can get involved, that's the great way to do it. Yeah. And there's a Slack channel and stuff like that there too. All right, cool. Mm -hmm. Let's keep moving. Um, Nova, you pick one. Okay, I'll take uh, bringing on-prem Kates to Cloud Party for 500. Cloud <laughs> Parity. Have you read this article? I have not, but I'm going to ask questions and maybe we can answer it all together. I don't know. Yes. I wrote the book on this stuff, so I figured I might have something yes. intelligible to say. Rafi and I read this one. Yeah. What did y'all think about it? I, every time I see something like this, I'm like, that person is brave, you know, like there's a ton of, there's a ton of value you get out of having an infrastructure that service underneath. And when you start mm -hmm. getting into some of the on-prem models, it's, it's hard to replicate. Um, but they call out like some of the gaps, you know, in, in, in core Kubernetes here. Now, is this built around cluster API or, or what's the actual tooling here? I think this, I think the subject is really just like what's missing and what, and what it would, what would be necessary to get it so it wouldn't be missing. So they're highlighting some projects from the from the ecosystem that fill in some of those gaps, like Rook for object storage, et cetera. Interesting. I mean, it's a bold move, but I guess if they can pull it off, I think it's going to be rad. Mm -hmm. Well, I think right. this is more just a guidance in terms of like, hey, if you're not running on the cloud, here are the pieces that Kubernetes doesn't provide that you're probably going to want to consider. And so, yeah, so storage, uh, block storage, object storage, load balancing using yeah. Metal LB. Uh, node level metrics with Prometheus and Grafana, uh, cert manager for doing some of the certificate lifecycle stuff. They're suggesting GitHub for CI CD. But it's interesting Today, to actually sort of do that gap analysis of if you're going to run on prem, you know, what are the other things you need to, to fill? Do they talk about having infrastructure, like having pools of servers that we would be able to use for a tool like Cluster API? Or is that, is this more of just I like. I think a, it's more of a more high level than more that. More of a, a tour of each project for a given section. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. They well, do talk about infrastructure wise, you still don't have a machine provisioning like EC2. And so they're going to be looking at sort of the MAS stuff from Canonical, which is uh, an interesting choice. Cool. Yeah. But maybe that's a future blog post. But, and I think this is sort of my angle to Kubernetes, right? Like I'm, uh, I've been doing storage at VMware for a while and, uh, you know, I, I was saying this just this week, uh, like Kubernetes is one thing, but on-prem you, you want to have it all. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that, that, that's actually what brought me to this whole thing. All right, let's keep going. Duffy, you're next. Uh, I'm going to take, let's see. I'm going to take that last one. The folks at Jetstack described multi-cluster ODC. This is this is neat. So, wait. <coughs> so, the, go ahead. Okay, keep keep just start. I'm gonna I'm I'm, I'm figuring out how the world works. So. Okay. <laughs> so this is actually um so I I think this is actually uh, reliant on the work that like um. Folks like Joel Speed did while at while on while working on on this project, 
Um, but basically they took, what was the name of that project that was before Kubo OIDC proxy? We all used it. I can't remember what it was called. We oh, actually, uh, it's like OIDC proxy maybe. Oh or, no, there's Q proxy. Yeah, no, no, Q it's OIDC proxy. Yeah, and it was from, oh God, who was it from? Yeah, I'd have to go look again. But. I think it was when, it, when it's like square or something. Is it, this might be a... So this is basically the fork that Jetstack took and started running with, I think. Gotcha, okay, cool. Um, and what they've written here is actually pretty cool because it's basically a combination of DEX, um, Cubo ADC proxy, uh, Gangway, a few other tools, and they're basically trying to provide a way such that you can consistently use OIDC tokens created by this, um, cre created using this method across multiple clusters. So solving this single credential login problem, and then you still have, of course, you still have R back to solve at each cluster, but at least from the perspective of like whether your token, whether your token allows you to authorize in, um, or sorry, authenticate in would be um, would be useful. So I thought that was a pretty cool article. It might be kind of fun to to do an ep to do an episode on this and just see if we can get it working with Kind or across a couple of yeah. different. Um, the episode that I did on securing the Kubernetes um, dashboard, yeah, uh, uh, pulls in a lot of this stuff also. Um, it does. Yep. Yeah. So I thought, but I like the idea that it's like, I mean, this is one of the few times I've seen somebody try to solve the authentication problem across clusters. And it's something I've given some thought to. I mean, like there are a few built-in models that you can do for this, but it is it is kind of it is kind of interesting. One of the big questions I have for the way this is built, and I haven't tried it myself yet, so I'm still curious, but one of the questions I have for how this is built is like, uh, did they think about the fact that you're sort of like that OIDC proxy now is uh, a high value thing, right? Like so wherever that's hosted, it has to be, <laughs> it is now like the keys to the kingdom. You know, you have to make sure that thing is, it has a high availability. It's not gonna go down otherwise. Yeah, totally. You know, yeah. All right, cool. All right, Brian, you get one. Um, let's go and do the, the one by Achmed, um, the, the cube control plugin. Yeah, cube control Yeah, free. this was, he like uh, hacked this together over the holidays because yeah, and, and the reason that I want to bring it up is first, um, it's a it's a really good idea, and it shows that the the power of Q um, control plugins and what information is just available to you and and the display he has is pretty good. But the real reason I brought it up is because Achmed has definitely gone above and beyond uh, this. Um, something else that I want to highlight that didn't make it to our list is that if you are um, a native Turkish speaker, Achmed actually has like a cloud native YouTube thing on on um, a video series now. And the reason I like it is because, you know, I'm, I'm, I was born in the United States, I think. And I speak English as my first language. You think what, like, you're not sure, you, uh, you know, there's, there's words. Um, but um, it's neat to see that that um, some of this data or some of this information can be shared in other languages, because um, you speak Turkish, and you don't really speak English guess what, um, you're missing out. So it's good to see when people are taking this information that we take for granted and send it out in um, other languages so other people can handle it because they definitely can, can do this. But what I really like about this is um, Aquin has really stayed, cr stayed true to his crew project and he's really just thinking about what, a, what do plugins look like in, in the cube control space. So mm -hmm. yeah, I just thought this was a good, a good it's a pretty good idea, actually. This yeah. reminds me of a um, Cube Spy. Do you remember that from Palumi? Yeah. Um, was... This is this is way less smart than that, though. Yeah. yeah. This is just it's just looking at owner refs, and and I think that's pretty cool how you can just do that. Just what you can get. Oh, out of look! It. There's Ahmed's in the here. We need to send Ahmed a T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, if he's here, definitely. Um... <laughs> we'll send you a Tazu T-shirt, man. <laughs> oh, right. for sure, for sure. And, and then also, just um, since I know he's here, shout out to him because um, we see you and 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 you're really doing good stuff. So I think you should just be called out just in general. Very cool stuff. And I love, so one of the things that I think is fascinating here, I'm gonna, cause I saw Evan and some of the Knative folks are, are on the line, is there's an example here of a uh, cube control tree being used against a Knative uh, service. And this ready thing here 
is interesting because the, the key native folks um, have a standard way to represent sort of conditions in a way where you can generically represent whether something is sort of quiesced and ready. And so, um, so, you know, being able to sort of, you know, build on top of that, I think is actually pretty cool. Yeah, and that's just like a, a thing for everyone. Um, if you have a chance to use conditions in your status, please do. It makes tool builders so much happier when we actually can figure out what your thing is doing. Yeah, and I assume that's what I'm at using here because uh, that makes sense. All right, cool. All right, so that's that one. Uh, Christian, which one do you want to grab? It's a good question. Um, let me see, let me see, let me see. Mm, the transparency report, I haven't read it, but um, I, I, I'm curious. So we're, oh, here, we, um, the, where, where, I, oh, the, the transparency CNCF report. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, some of the highlights were, there was almost 12,000 registrations. That's kind of neat, yeah. that's, that's huge. The highlights here are amazing. I mean, 65%. What, what struck me was 65% first time. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, that's huge, right? Yeah, that is that is pretty huge. Um, and and I had one of those one thousand eight hundred submissions, uh, out of which you know mine didn't make it. Um, I'm I love, still pretty sorry about that. <laughs> well, <laughs> and I had the honor of um, denying your submission, so I was I was oh, part you. of the party too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but one thing but, is really important, and it's the fifth one: one, two, three, four, five from the bottom. Um, of the keynote speakers, 58% identified as men and 42% as women or non-binary binary or other genders. Um, it's 2020 now, and I will tell you, you do not understand how hard it was. Um, I had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with execs. I had to tell someone, you're just not going to do this. And, and they fought me for about a month, but I won. Um, so really what this is a testament to, we're not where we want to be, but if you have a position to make a change, take it and make that change. This was definitely a fight. Nicely done, Brian. Seriously. And, 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 and one of the things that you know the CNCF does a lot, they put a lot of budget behind um, you know, these diversity scholarships of actually making attendance to KubeCon available to a wider set of folks. Um, I another Another thing that we're doing this uh, this round at KubeCon is we've been working on re redoing the uh, the Women's Empower Her event and just for bringing that a little more like closer to the people and actually getting people hands on keys a little more similar to the diversity lunch trying to actually make a difference uh, for people who may not have an opportunity to attend some of the other diversity events. So we're trying in a lot of different ways to try a lot of different things and it's just really cool to see everybody coming together and focusing on this. And uh, can you can you shed some light on how the diversity scholarships work? Like uh, who gets selected, and you know what's uh, what brings up your chance of of making it? Uh, like um, I, I haven't I haven't read up on, on on the details there. It sounds like a fantastic program, but uh, sort of how, how do you select? So basically, um, as with m most things at the CNCF, it's a very loose process that's very very poorly defined, uh, but we do the best we can. And so like, to kind of give like, an idea of, of where it came from and where we are today, uh, the first C diversity scholarship, there was five of us. It was like myself, and I don't know if y'all know Lucas, who did a lot of work with Cube Admin. Both of us won, and that has grown over the past couple of years. And now we're, you know, we raised, I think, $80,000 one year from Microsoft and from Google. And that money comes together, and that allows us to basically go through uh, we, we ask questions from folks and we put together a scale of over five attributes. The whole philosophy here is we try to pick people who wouldn't have an opportunity to go, who have never been before, and that we think because of their situation, they would actually get a lot out of it and it would impact them the most. And we, we sit down and we try to score folks and then we take the averages of those scores and then we look at our budget and however many uh, people we can bring. And then we go through and we start the actual process of reaching out to them, talking to them about their situation. There's a lot of work of just like, you know, some people have never even flown before. Some people are having problems with getting into a country or out of a country. And it's just kind of this, this long process of doing everything we can to get people there to make KubeCon a once in a lifetime experience for them. That's amazing. I, I, this is the first time I have seen such a program for for a conference, and uh, I, you know, I, 
Thank you. Yeah. Sure. All right. So since we're talking about KubeCon um, uh, and we haven't given away a t-shirt in a while, uh, the first person in the comments that can tell us the, 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 the date and the hotel that the first KubeCon was in will, uh, and you can only win one t-shirt, sorry. The real first KubeCon or the, the fake first KubeCon? Let them figure that out. The okay. one that was called KubeCon in its pre-CNCF. <laughs> okay. Ooh, pre-CNCF, that's a good one. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so I get to do one now. I'm gonna do, um, let's see, what do we have left? I'm gonna do, oh, uh, Brennan's Configula. Configula. <laughs> so this is, so Brendan just announced on Twitter this morning this new this new project that he's he he uh, did called Configula. And number one, I love the name. It reminds me of Funicula. I think we were yep. laughing about it earlier. Um, for those who you know uh, have, have read that book when you were small. Um, so the fascinating thing here is that, um, and I think this is really really cool. He's essentially taking some of the ideas. Have, have, if you've done React programming with uh, JSX, it's this essential JavaScript preprocessor sort of dialect where you can embed HTML directly in JavaScript. So it's like it's like JavaScript with HTML literals in it. Um, and so he did the same thing with Python and YAML. And so instead of actually doing like all the wacky stuff with curly braces and stuff like that, you can just take the YAML and embed it any place where you would use uh, essentially a dictionary type of thing. Um, let's see. So Rory has it right, mm -hmm. QCon 2015 in the Palace Hotel. You don't have a date there, but was that, no, it wasn't 2013. <laughs> um, Tomiko, the prize is a, is a t-shirt that you already have. <laughs> oh, but we can send a, a Falco t-shirt or a Falco hoodie if you want. There you go. Oh, November 9th. Okay, so I think Rory gets it here. Okay, uh, t-shirt for Rory that. then. Just go. And uh, um, and uh, the fascinating thing was the, the 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 hotel room was above BART, and every time a BART train went underneath, it caused enough interference that it caused the uh, the all the microphones to cut out. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> all right, cool. So yeah, so anyway, so the Configula thing is essentially embedding YAML into um, into uh, uh, Python. And then having the ability to essentially then take that thing and then render it on out. And so it's a Python first with YAML in the middle type of thing, which I think is kind of interesting. And I think it's, it's fascinating to like compare and contrast that to YTT, because YTT is YAML with embedded Python, whereas this is Python with embedded YAML. Well, uh, clearly we need more things embedded with YAML. <laughs> I know, right? And so the fascinating thing for me is that this is a, um, this is a, uh, uh, you know, there's a, you know, there's a, there's still a lot of interesting ideas to explore in this space. And I don't think we're ever going to get to the point where there's one true way to be able to manage uh, and sort of template this type of stuff. There's, there's always going to be new ideas. No, I do like that it's, um, that, the, that the YAML piece is like a first class thing though. And it's not just this random thing you took smack dab into the middle of your you know, whatever you're creating, like you would do with a templating language. Yeah. So now the interesting thing that I think is missing from this is, um, and it's probably a solvable problem, but the thing that I like about Q and, and, and some of the stuff we kind of started to do with, with JSON it, with JSON it was essentially being schema aware so that you can validate this because it's so easy as you're building these things to actually produce something that looks right, but isn't. Um, yeah, um, we need more schema aware tools in our space. Even our editors who are kind of schema aware, they're not really. Um, so yeah. yeah, we definitely need that. All right, so that's that one. All right, so uh, should we rotate around to the top? George, you want to do one, you do should, another one? Uh, you should definitely segue to the, the, the Grafana one since you mentioned JSON it and case on it. Yeah, definitely. Although I don't have the technical chops to explain this. I'm sure Duffy does. Well, I thought, I mean, this would be kind of an interesting one about back and forth between Joe and Brian too, because- I, Absolutely, yes. It's a rewrite. It's not, I mean, like some of the primitives that they, that, that you know, y'all put into Casonet um, are still are still in this, but it's a, it's a rewrite of 
of what they wanted to see out of it rather than a fork, which I thought was interesting. Okay, for those not aware, so there's this con there's this configuration language called JSON. It one of the first projects that we did at Heptio was this thing called Case on it, um, and sort of we we sort of attacked this from a couple couple of different angles. We ended up stepping back from it just because we weren't seeing the sort of uptake that we liked, and and uh, we decided to put you know uh, some of our efforts into building tools like Octant. Um, but in true open source fashion, other folks took these ideas and ran with it. And I think that's really cool to see. And so the Grafana, Grafana folks sort of did a rewrite of it called uh, Tonka, Tanka, Tonka. I, I assume Tonka, yeah. Tonka. Um, and some of the things that are interesting, <coughs> is that they, they, some of the stuff is the same, but like they actually step back from some of the stuff here, um, like the components, prototypes, and uh, and went back to something that was a lot more focused for them. And so I think it's really cool to actually see the uh, see the evolution here. Yeah, and um, just one quick thing. They were they were on. I mean, they 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 hopped into. I think they really um, hopped into the Ksonic project before we shut it down. And and they were they've been doing some crazy Jsonic things for a while. So um, I knew whenever they pinged me after we shut the Ksonic product project down that this was this was coming. So I'm glad to see that they say they stuck with it. Yeah. So very very cool. So everybody should check that out. I do like JSON and I think, I think it's like between JSON, there's like so many interesting tools being built here. All right. One thing that's interesting yeah. about JSON is I definitely see more projects that are based on that than than any other common like take, you know, which I thought True. was yeah. interesting. All right, Nova, you want to do another one? No, y'all are doing good at these and I haven't had a chance to read these, but I'll try All right, to so I'm going to do this one that is absolutely hilarious. I think it this is, is the last one. Well, there were a couple other sort of announcements here. Okay. So this is, and I don't, I don't, I don't know if the sound will work, if it'll come through. So this is apparently a screen cap from this Japanese TV show play, where it's a high drama moment as they're actually like doing stuff with Kubernetes. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, who doesn't in. want to compete with 15 people standing right over your shoulder? But you don't even like, know they're there know because, you're, because you're surrounded by rolling text, so you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, I and, love how they're visualizing the code. And, and they um and in that screenshot, it it was kind of like a copy of what the um of the G Cloud tool, but they called it Cloud instead. I know, right? It's hilarious. I think that's a GK. It's a GKE. I think that's a GKE trick. Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, so from from now on, TGIK, we're gonna have like text scrolling with me, like you know. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, and so then, George, you want to cover? There were a couple other ones here, the contributor summit. Did we do this one? Oh, there's a survey. Uh, so this is the contributor survey uh, related yeah. related to those of you that have, are contributing or have tried to contribute and failed. Uh, we send out regular surveys uh, as part of SIG Contributor Experience to kind of see how people are consuming our tools, consuming our documentation, and places, pain points, and stuff that we can fix. So it would really help us out if if you contributed or are interested in contributing to check that out. Cool. And then the other one was the community meetings. Yeah, so these are switching to a monthly cadence. Um, really nothing... Uh, Nothing too earth shattering here. For those of you who have never heard of this meeting though, this is a really good meeting. It meets once a month where you get updates from SIGs uh, from across the project. So it's a good play. It's kind of like a good commons area where you can get an overall view of what's happening in Kubernetes as opposed to you know, having to decide one of the 57 meetings that we have throughout the week for each. It's a good way to sort of keep a pulse of what's going on in that. Exactly, you, you get a nice 10 minute status from each SIG and they rotate and it's really useful. And I publish the notes to those uh, on a regular basis there. So you can definitely consume those and turn those off. And they're recorded. This is definitely one of the, I, I, I recently recorded them. a, I recently recorded a podcast on like how to keep up with stuff like this. And I think that this is definitely a great, a great way to do that because it's not, you know, like keeping up with stuff is really difficult, especially as you realize, you know, what keeping up means to, it means different things to different people. Like some people are really focused on what's happening with the code base or with the architectural design stuff. Some people just want that like 10 minute overview of the projects within some larger project to understand what's happening and, and give them like, you know, 
a view into the picture without having to like really zoom in everywhere, you know? So this is a great tool for that. Cool. So that's our uh, week in review stuff. It took us longer because we were shooting the shit, but um, any other items that you all think should be there, including from the comments or the peanut gallery? Yeah. Any cool tools you've seen in the past few weeks? Let's move talk on. About that? Yeah. What's that? Let's move on. Let's move on. All right. We'll move on. So uh, giving away a t-shirt here, Bogdan Luca from Bucharest. I randomly picked you. You've won a t-shirt. Uh, feel free to ping me my information's in chat. And I got one for Ahmed and Rory McCoon. Is there a trivia question that we want to ask next? Or do we want to move on to the Ooh, What was the first KubeCon we had a live TGIK at? Ooh. And where was it? KubeCon Austin. Ugh. I don't think you're eligible. Oh, wait, yeah. am I not? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we, have a, we have a limited number of questions, and you just, you just took it away from us. Hey, Chris, I have a question for you. Yeah. Who won the five-year anniversary Kubernetes trivia contest? This is a fantastic question. Brian Lyles was the official winner in his team for the, the Kubernetes trivia contest that we did. And Chris Novo is on my team as well. I was actually shouting you out, Chris. Mm, mm. <laughs> so we, we actually do have a question from LaMatty who I'm gonna send the t-shirt to no matter what, because he's always here and always supported the show. So uh, ping me, I will send you a t-shirt. Ask, uh, host, what is, what is a surprise fun thing that you learned uh, during TGIK that you weren't expecting to? Oh, I, I'll go because um, I did it one time, but uh, you all can see, watch YouTube, you watch the YouTube and you watch whoever's talking and you're like, oh, that's cool. Look at them go through this view and then go through this view and go to the title. Let me tell you something. Um, the breaking configuration that we have to actually make this thing go would drive you bonkers. Are you just talking like OBS and getting it set up? Getting it's OBS little... set up? Oh my gosh. It, it was um it was a bit much it was a little overwhelming like i didn't want to do it anymore I'm like this is this is too much and that was actually the biggest thing for me anything kubernetes related <laughs> just throwing it out there maybe we should run <laughs> Kuber or obs in containers in kubernetes so that way this isn't a problem let's see no, what well, I think, I mean, going meta, I think, you know, the thing that surprised me that I learned is that people enjoy it when they see the real deal of people sort of learning stuff and operating. And so you think as you're presenting that you have to have everything totally down pat, no mistakes, like this very linear sort of exploration of something. And I think the, the big lesson for me from doing TGIK from the beginning was that, you know, those detours, making mistakes, being human, looking stuff up on Google, all that stuff really, you know, is, is part of what makes it the experience. So, yeah. In a similar Completely vein, agree. I think I really like doing TJK, TGIK selfishly because I like to learn from the audience, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's hilarious. Like every single episode I've done, someone hops in chat and is like, oh, we implemented it this way. Or, hey, have you looked at this project? So, you know, I just want to do them so that you all can teach me rather than me teaching you, right? I mean, I have maybe the right way to say it, there are no experts, right? There's nobody out there that knows all of this stuff all the time. Right. Nope. I was I, one of the things that surprised me recently was I was doing a, a deep dive on one of the Kubernetes components, and I thought that I knew where to find the piece of code that I was looking for, so I could talk about it. And I'm like, nope, I got no idea where it is. And somebody from the audience was like, oh, it's here. And I'm like, that's awesome. You know, like to your point, you know, there are no experts. We are all together an expert. Like that's what it takes. It takes it takes a community. And even though it just happened, I'm always constantly surprised how the author of something happens to be listening. Right. <laughs> Every time you bring something up. <laughs> any other any other things that you've learned the most? I mean, I think I've got a lifetime of handy bash one liners that I've learned from audience members that have really just changed my ability to run Kubernetes and to demo Kubernetes. There's just small things that like it's a hidden flag and a the uh, cubectal tool that you would never know about but it actually makes your life way easier it might even be like a good exercise to go through and start to like compile some of these because there's some good stuff there one of the first tgik episodes i ever watched actually was one with you chris and and i learned something in that one you were like get check out dash it's the same as cd dash it just oh, yeah. brings you back and i was like what? 
Like, I've been doing this for like 15 years. Really? Like, <laughs> that's a thing. I, I actually think I learned that from somebody on TGIK and then later used it in a different episode of TGIK. And then now you're telling me that you learned it there. So yeah. I, I think it's, it's interesting to see how it's all grown and all come together. Awesome. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting to see how people work on their desktop. Um, I especially like when Duffy does his videos and um, his, his very curated um, desktop experience is, is always makes what he's saying very enjoyable. Funny. Wait, Joe's AWS cluster got hacked? Yeah, hat? yeah, yeah. So, so we're going to talk about where was like, where yeah. did things go wrong? Let's segue. That, that's a perfect segue to like the biggest disaster that ever happened to you at TGIK. So I'll start with that one because I think that's definitely the top of my list, and and I I, I feel bad. I don't want to name the project because like it's it was you know half my fault. But I was trying out this um, this uh, uh, serverless project in an episode, and I had a cluster up and running, and um, and it's one of those things where I was running on AWS, but a lot of times people develop locally with something like Minikube, and I'm like, well, I need to get to this thing so that I can hit the web page and all that. And there was a line in there that says, oh, you can just expose it to the whole world and you'll be, you know, good to go. And I'm like, I'm like, that's ah, a little dangerous. How bad could it be? And so I like, I did it. And the author was actually in the chat encouraging me to do that. So I did it. And then somebody from the audience ran a sort of a Bitcoin miner on the cluster. And normally that would be okay. But one of the other lessons I learned is that I was running these things on fractionally sized interests, uh, fra fractionally sized uh, uh, instances on AWS, the, the sort of the small ones. Um, because, you know, we were running a startup and I was cheap. And like, you know, if you don't work for a cloud provider, you got to pay for this stuff. And, uh, and those things, like if you hit a certain level of, like they, they work with, like they can do bursting in terms of CPU and, and but like as soon as they see like like cryptocurrency mining on those things, they like throttle them down to nothing. So it essentially ended up killing the cluster and made the whole thing go wonky. It showed the project poorly. I felt super bad about it. And so now I'm a lot more paranoid about like anytime when I'm exposing something, not making it uh, uh, something that people can hit right away. I figure if it's like a really long string and then people can't type it in, maybe I'll be safe. But like if it's something that, you know, somebody could actually type in and muck with, you know, there's a good chance somebody's going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Do, Joe, do you remember the time when you were doing a TGIK and I was sitting out in the hallway? Uh, and yeah, and that's what this whole environment was like, was like there was just this secret room at the Heftio office and then there'd be like a group of people hanging out right outside the door and like walking by and making silly faces. But uh, one of the times you were doing like a vote and I wrote uh, a bash for loop and I just started pinging your TGIK demo over and over. And I ultimately took down the entire Heptio's office and took Joe off the air because he lost internet. <laughs> one of the that like, I think that was Linker D because they have that sort of that vote app that is their sample project. Uh, yeah, I think it, the, I can't remember what it was, but that sounds like something. I just remember that we were all trying to vote for emojis, and I really wanted like the rainbow unicorn one to win. So I, I was just sitting there, just like running all these loops on my local laptop, and then ultimately we took our internet down. Yeah, that is definitely Linkerd's example app, the emoji vote. Yep. Um, uh, well, I got another one. Um, so this is a TGK, TGIK live. So not only are you, so when, whenever you do it on um, YouTube, you're at least a little <coughs> bit insulated from people looking at you as you as you totally bomb on software. Or if they get seen. up and leave, you don't see it. <laughs> yeah, if they get up and leave, they don't see it. But um, back back in November, we are, I was doing a project on and and at a KubeCon, and I think it was going okay. But the problem is, is that the the room was so loud. You could not hear anything. So I couldn't hear myself. I couldn't hear people talking to me. It was super crowded. And I was struggling with this software because I assumed that the docs would be better than they were. And I mean, if I could actually turn red, I probably would have. But I, I think I hit it pretty well. So, so yeah, that was, a, that was definitely a stressful moment. I think that's yeah, I always, another... always make sure that like I read through a t there, at least I have a tutorial that looks like it should converge before I do a project. I mean, if you know, but most projects know that they have to have something like that. But it's it's interesting that you know you didn't even have that, Brian. Yeah. 
So uh, I think there's definitely an art to being able to be, like get ready for TGIK. And sometimes you, you see a project and you're like, this one's gonna be a lot of work and it just goes perfectly. <clears throat> and then other times the, the documentation is the other way and you, you end up struggling the whole time and things go wrong. But uh, it was always like Thursday or Wednesday of the week I would come in and be like, okay, I'm reading some docs and however much free time I have this week is gonna be how much time I have and we're just gonna make it work. So that's definitely what was your big, biggest mess up, Chris? So I think the great example of this one was when I was doing uh, CATA containers and I brought in my Arch Linux tower because I wanted to run it locally on Linux and just getting it installed and nested virtualization and then trying to run it in the cloud and just ultimately what I assumed was just going to be a very simple uh, Linux binary turned out to be a little bit more complex and Ultimately, by the end of the episode, we we got most of it running, and we had folks there kind of explaining what was going on. But that was one time where I was like probably a little too focused on like setting up my Linux computer so I could do Linux and not focused enough on the actual tool I was getting ready to demo. I was gonna say that was definitely a takeaway for me too. Like, it wasn't necessarily a disaster because I was able to like come back and do another episode. But there have been a few episodes where I thought that I'd be able to do all of it in one and I just like two hours later I'm like okay that's it for today and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna finish this later <laughs> and like because it you know I just couldn't it just wasn't it, it wasn't one one episode's worth of thing you know but but, but isn't this how all coding is like you you, you think this thing is going to take you half an hour right. and then you know it's, it's the end of the day suddenly and you know nothing is done I think that's an interesting thing Christian because like it feels like you're coding when you're doing uh, TGIK because like you kind of get into a zone, you get into a mode, and then you look up and you're like, holy crap, it's been an hour and a half, right? And like, yeah. it, it, it tends to move pretty fast when you're doing it, Yeah, at least for me. Speaking of moving fast, we only have about 10 minutes left. Um, we can go you know, unless we can go over. You, yeah, yeah. We'll, but you we'll, want to we'll do, just... do another t-shirt, George? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, do we have a trivia question or am I just picking someone on the internet? Anyone have any questions mm. for the panel here? When what 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 was the date of Josh's first episode? Ooh, that is a good one. Um, speaking of the tools and things that you've covered, each of you, uh, what was the favorite coolest thing that you covered this year? And then the second part is, what do you want to cover next year? Are there any? I know people file GitHub mm -hmm. issues for stuff that they want to see covered. Do you have any anything on the top of your mind where you're like, ooh, I cannot wait to cover that on TGIK? So I'm, I'm going to break the mold here. Um, yeah, I only covered one thing, something I wrote. I covered Octant back in the summer. I believe, yeah, it was late summer when I covered that. And I really enjoyed getting it out there. But I actually wanted to um, think of something different. Like um, TJK is a, is a really good um, output format. But really what I would like to do is um, do some more longer, some more longer term think things. And I don't know what that is. So like go in deep on a topic for a while. So um, something I've been doing at conferences recently is doing a Kubernetes troubleshooting primer. And I'll go for two hours and I'll say, it's Friday afternoon and you did a deploy and it doesn't work. And then we work through it backwards. So I would love to actually, instead of just going through a project would actually just show the opposite side. Now, you know, it's hit the fan. What do I do? What do I look at? What tools do I run? And not just my own, I mean like everyone, like what would we do? So I would love to do that and going into this year and I've been talking, so it's gonna happen. I just gotta figure out when. One of the things we used to do at Microsoft was we would uh, we would take laptops and we would preload them the software for someone before they're walking on stage to do a demo. And this person had never used this laptop a day in their life before. And then they tried to do a successful demo and that's how we learned about a lot of like Windows tools and things in the Windows we wouldn't have actually realized otherwise. And uh, it might be a good exercise to like duff, have Duffy or someone set up a cluster and put some tools on it and say, Brian, you know, come in and try to figure out a way to actually run your application here or set it up with a CI CD system that you've never used before. And that's that. Yeah, that's a wow, Chris, with the with the great suggestions. Good job, Chris. That was pretty dope. The projects that I wanted to get into, I want to dig deeper into the Argo project. Um, you know, we did an episode early, early on on Argo workflows, but it's sort of like bloomed into sort of an umbrella 
they're merging it with some of the the, the tools from Weave. Weave yeah. Um, and so that's a really interesting project that um, you know, and it's not just one project. There's a bunch of different things that come together, and I'd love to spend some more time looking at that. Ooh, yeah, audience. Also, let us know what what you'd like to see covered here live as well. So, so, so Joe, I'm I'm curious. You you seem to be biased in your selection of of topics. Um, I, I I I see you not pick up storagey things. Is that because you don't like them? They're too complex. They will never work in an hour. But I got to be honest. I don't think I'm smart enough to run a storage system, right? Look. So there's like there's different like. So like, here's the thing. So networking is scary because you can push a configuration change and like totally like take out the entire thing, right? Um, you know, uh, when you're running compute systems, it's like you can reboot things and sort of smooth it over and everything comes back. Um, with storage, if you screw up, it's like your, your screw up is there forever. <laughs> and so like, it takes a level of like attention to detail and paranoia to successfully administer and run a storage system that I'm not sure I personally am well suited to. And so I like, I have a hard time sort of like trying to talk smart about storage when I know that like, if I give people bad advice, they could lose data forever, right? So that's the type of stuff that scares me. I'm just like, I'm so paranoid that like, I, I'm really, I, I have a hard time sort of like, like I, you know, storage scares the crap out of me to be honest. <laughs> I mean, like he, the the question was, what, what to do more of? Like, uh, that's definitely what I want to do in the new year, uh, or like, I guess the new year has started already. But uh, you know, c cover more storagey things because there's just lots of uh, lots of them out there. I think last year, a lot of projects developed operators and uh, really made them run well on Kubernetes and uh, you know build a lot of automation. And um, I definitely want to dig more into that. Well, anytime you can find bandwidth, we'd love to have you do it, Christian. <laughs> Have we done an OLM store show yet? <clears throat> nope. I don't think so. I, I went in deep yesterday, and now I'm like, oh, I want to talk about this. So maybe that's should talk come about up. what? I'm sorry. O that... OLM. Um, Red Hat some um, operator lifecycle. Oh yeah. Management tool. Some really cool stuff in there. So yeah. Have we done OPA? Just curious. Yeah. Yes, we have. Yeah. I did Although I don't think we've ever done one on like. On specifically on the stuff that is coming out of OP, like um, the drawbridge stuff, or what was it yeah. called? Not drawbridge. Um, gatekeeper. Test? Gatekeeper. Oh, gatekeeper. Yeah. So that was the stuff that Microsoft donated to the project. That's essentially Kubernetes specific setups and stuff like that. I think it wasn't when I did it. It was just getting started, and so it wasn't super mature yet. So. Um, so we do have some answers here uh, for the Josh's first episode. June 8th, but then someone said June 7th, depending on where you live. So, Josh, have you made a decision so on who the... Either Joy or Carrie? <laughs> yeah, I think Carrie might have gotten it first, depending on where she where they live. So, so you know what? We I could do two t-shirts. I right. say both. <laughs> so, so, Carrie and Joy. So, Carrie and Joy, <laughs> you won Tanzu t-shirts. And I will repost my, uh, my email address here. Yeah, okay. please spam George. Please spam please. George. Don't please worry. spam George. You know, we have we have a uh, hundred concurrent viewers watching right now, so that's really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. The Cilium Hubble stuff would be interesting, I think. That would be a that'd be a good one. Is there anything that's a, else? That's... So is Cilium then the one that you would want to cover in 2020? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, I think that would be a fun one to watch. I've actually really been enjoying building the um the grokking series, which I've May not be the best name, but I've been enjoying doing that. And I'm like one episode in on the API server. I suspect it'll be like two more before the API server is done. Um, but I definitely am looking forward to like finishing that out just in time for all of the stuff that I talked about to be deprecated and start playing with. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you know, it's I think it's a fun the fun way of learning to explore all of this stuff. You know, like. So, this is the 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 hard copy version of the API. Oh yes, almost immediately out of date, right? I mean, you don't have one on your desk. I keep it close. That's no, cool. it's, it's on it's on the inside of my eyelids, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I would actually. Is, is, is that an environmentally sane idea to do? No, not even remotely. 
So I would love to have some episodes with some of the K Native co colleagues coming in and really sort of going deep into some K Native stuff. Would be really cool. That would be awesome, actually. And they're on the call, so um, they see. Evan's here, yeah. Yes, Evan is here. Yeah, and that, I know Shahar was saying like episode on favorite serverless on Kubernetes. I have a reminder for George. There is a reminder for George. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally the reminder to check the TGIK stream. Though. Yeah. Sorry. Coming to you live. Like, <laughs> There's a reason you all keep me off camera and silent. Was that your voice, George? <laughs> no, I have. So while the epi trivia, while the episode is happening, I have a Google Assistant at certain points. So I do certain things. George is all about the automation. It's yeah, amazing. You know, I learned from, I'm learned from the best. All right. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think like okay, and then and then um, CPP for life is like do sort of a, a survey, compare and contrast. I think we've done that with series where we'll do like one tool and then another tool and another tool and do a little compare and contrast. But I don't think we've done sort of like an overview of like let's go look at all the configuration tools and talk about pros and cons. That might be a good episode to do that. That'd be, I think I'd be, I think I would also like to see more episodes with more than just one of us. So like a topic like that would be great because it would be like, that'd be a good panel topic because there, there's no one person that's going to go study all of them. Yeah. Yeah. I think if we can find a way to do a panel topic and do some of the screen share and stuff like that, I think that that would be fun. I mean, you know, George, George knows how to do it. So we're, you know, we're, we're dangerous now. Must work. <laughs> um, Let's see, I'm, I'm reading this stuff. Top blooper, okay, so I'll go first mm -hmm. with, um, so this is different from sort of screwing up the cluster. In one of the early episodes, I think it was episode two or three, I was still figuring out OBS because it is a disaster of configuration, it's super hard. And I had my son in the office with me. And like, there's this interstitial where I, I have the, the title card up and I thought the microphone was muted. And he comes in and asks me a question and it got caught on the mic and broadcast and I hadn't realized it. And so that's a little bit of a blooper. That was kind of fun uh, to do that. Um, I think, you know, that was, I'll have to dig up which one that was, but that was uh, uh, like number one or two, or two or three, I think, of the episode very early on. Did you all have other bloopers? Things one, where- One that I have like every time, unfortunately, I guess you all don't usually see this one, is every time I start, I feel like I'm getting this echo back at me and I'm like, oh, my audio's messed up. The, like, why am I hearing myself again? Can anyone guess why I always hear myself at the start? Because you're playing it. Because I, I don't have to guess. Pre I have the preview yeah. open while I'm recording, exactly. So I'm like hearing myself back thinking there's something wrong with my audio, <laughs> but it's because I have this tab open that's talking back to me, right? Every time. I'm actually now in the habit of muting it, but it had, I have absolutely had that problem. My favorite though is like every, you start up OBS to do an episode and it's like, oh, do you want to upgrade to the latest version? And the answer is no. <laughs> but I've done there's been times when I'm like finding old versions of OBS and installing them like two minutes before the episode. <laughs> Yeah. Does it do this thing for you as well, where it resizes everything? Like you, you, you just set up everything perfectly, and then you're about to start, and it just everything is resized, and it's the wrong size, it's the wrong place, and it's just not coming back even. Yeah, that's OBS. Yes. <laughs> yes. The other I, one that's up. Oh, go ahead. The other one that got me was uh, here in the. So I work out of the office in San Francisco, the VMware office in San Francisco, and. There's the wireless network and there's the wired network. The wired network does not allow me to um, uh, send out uh, the or the RTMP protocol or whatever to YouTube. So I have to do it via the wireless. I opened an issue, I chased it down, nothing. And so because of that, I've actually had failures where for some reason, wireless being what it is, right? I've lost connectivity and in the middle of an episode, right? Like there went the session, but uh, it did come back. So. There have been a few times I think that's happened to a number of us where like the session just dry, died and then we were able to rejoin. So that was good. So um, uh, uh, Brian informs us that he has other stuff he has to get to. So he needs All to right. take off. Thank you so much for joining us, Brian. And we're going to have you doing more Brian. episodes. Don't worry. We, uh, that's we're right. Talking about, man. See you all later. Definitely more. All right. Have a good weekend, man. Bye. Cheers. So I accidentally <laughs> bloopered Nova during a show. So I always collect cool things from around the internet that are related. 
And Nova always does things that, uh, you know, she'll cover something in Go or something, you know, like outside of Kubernetes. So you were doing cool Unix tools or something. And you know how everyone loves those little hipster power line Go props that go in your terminal. I was like, oh, this is a cool one, Nova. Try this one. And then in the back of my head, I was like, oh, no, I'm going to break her terminal live. And it broke. And then, <laughs> and then you had to reset your terminal. I was like, I'm an, I should have not done that. <laughs> but it's called PowerLine-Go, and it's fantastic. <laughs> I can't even mention how many times like I've been like, oh, I'm just going to add something to my Bash RC live on TGIK. And it took like three or four mistakes for me of having to go and like roll my credentials for showing them on the air that I got to the point where it was like, nope, we do all of this off the screen. And I have to like make sure that I still have filler while I'm over here trying to like edit a bash profile and Emacs on the side. Uh, Lamati wants you to mention the gong, Joe, that would go off. Oh right yeah, okay. Way. So we had, um, we had an employee early on um, who uh, brought in this absolutely enormous gong. And, um, and it like the only place we could store the thing was in the room that we did TGIK. And like, <laughs> and so like, it was always in the background um, in the early episodes. And I think I hit it on 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 screen once uh, just to show it off. But then we would like when we had like milestones or like big sales or whatever, like we would hit the gong. And I know that there was one uh, episode where I was doing TGIK and the gong was actually out in the hallway and they hit it while I was doing TGIK. And I'm like, and that thing was loud. It was so loud. I don't know, you know, Nova, you heard it. I don't know if the rest of you were ever ever heard it live. It was, it was pretty crazy. It was a lot of fun. Did, did, has anybody here ever had somebody like accidentally walk in and then start talking to them while they're on the air? <laughs> this happened to me a few times when we were, but, yeah, well, <laughs> This happened to me a few times where somebody would come in and just like start talking about work or my day or something, and I'm just like, uh, "Hey, I'm I'm doing TGIK now." <laughs> nice one. So, All right, so tool. To Go ahead. I was gonna say tools that I've used in my time at TGIK that I found to be incredibly useful are things like DRM and Kind, which are two projects. Uh, DRM lets you like move into a directory and set environment variables, which sounds like the simplest thing in the world, but is incredibly valuable. <laughs> and the other one is Kind, which is a way of running Kubernetes locally using Docker. So basically Kubernetes and Docker. Like what are some tools that y'all have used that are just stuff that you keep that is just now part of your world that you got from TGIK? My favorite one-liner I, I learned from Joe in one of the first episodes, I think even from before I started working at Heptio, was just do creating an alias for whatever namespace you plan on working in so that you can just easily edit the default namespace or you know whatever tool namespace you're running in and then just applying that same shortcut like to different parts of the feedback command line tool that's that's completely changed my workflow in kubernetes a tool that i am 100 going to be using going forward for what it's worth um i don't know if you all have been following this but Red Hat, I believe they they published like a YAML language server. Have you all seen this? Speaking to like Brian's point about schema based editors and stuff, maybe VS Code just had this forever. Yeah, it's sick. And Instrumenta, uh, and I think particular is his name Gareth. I see yeah, him in the. Community. Am I saying it right? Okay, cool. They've got uh, the Kubernetes JSON schemas that they publish for every version. Uh, when it comes out and it's super rad. So what you do is you just pump those schemas into the YAML language server and then boom, Vim has complete documentation and auto completion of Kubernetes YAML. And I'm, I'm guessing probably VS Code probably uses the same model under the hood. So I'm psyched about that so that all of you watching can stop uh, watching me figure out what API version <laughs> something is, <laughs> right? I just like search for the Google, the, the Kubernetes docs and just copy and paste. That'd me. probably be faster, yeah. <laughs> That's how I always roll. <laughs> toss, toss the URL to that in the notes, Josh. That'd be a handy one, I think. Will do, yeah. Yeah, we need it. We need a, like a little episode. We need like a little, you know, quick how-to on on that trick. That sounds like, that sounds pretty cool. Yeah, Gareth actually has a ton of stuff. I will definitely shout out to Gareth. Like, um, he's one of the people behind Comp Test and a lot of the um the, the tools to actually allow you to do some validation of, of YAML before you try to submit that to Kubernetes and get kicked. I mean, it's incredibly cool. My Vim setup is from SPF 13. I've just slightly modified it from, from SPF 13 stuff, which is really like 
and a great place to start. It's like a Vim distribution. <laughs> so, so Tunde is is suggesting uh, a deep dive on IPv6 at some point. Um, yeah, I, that that's definitely one I want to do, especially because it's starting to firm up like dual stack. Yep. And so I know that there's a lot of work in the kind project to try and get that to a place where we can start using it there. Um, there's already some IPv6 capability, but I think the dual stack stuff is kind of like being developed. I think kind is one of the first projects that's actually doing testing or validation of IPv6 stuff. And so I definitely want to do more of a deep dive on that, show how that works, talk about some of the interesting trade-offs and um, that kind of stuff. I just saw that uh, Valerie just landed the cube proxy addition stuff for that. So that's now a possible thing inside of IP tables, which is a huge thing to wrap your head around. So go Valerie. Um, yeah. And then that's my, on my list. Suggesting several episodes on sort of uh, securing cakes and best practices and stuff, which is, mm -hmm. yeah, that's another one of those where it's like, you're never going to be, comp you know, totally comprehensive. There's always more to be done, right? It's, uh, but I think, you know, the, the sort of high priority ones is definitely worthwhile for sure. Um, yep. um, cool. All right. So we're going to give away, how about one more t shirt and one more question and then we call it? Does that sound good, George? Yeah, that sounds good. But I also do want to end up with thing you're looking forward the most in 2020 in Kubernetes or Kubernetes ecosystem. Kind of, get, I want to finish off on a speculative, give us a call thing. But we do have time uh, for one more question. Does anybody in the audience have a question? Let's give them a chance. Or we can we can make that be the last question. Okay. All right. Um, so what are y'all? What, what guesses are y'all making for 2020? Try to be specific. You can't be like make Kubernetes boring. Trying to think. Or a cool I'm excited tool to have uh, dynamic auditing uh, finally make it all over the hump. I think that's going to be cool. I think a lot of security tools are going to start using it, and it's going to be easier for folks to, to really tweak their uh, how they're telling the auditing story. I mean, there's a couple that are interesting. So, um, I'm really interested in seeing what Cilium has in store for 2020. I, I feel like there's a lot of potential there. Um, that, hasn't yet been realized, um, but they're but they're on the on the fast path to get it realized. So that's pretty awesome. I think it's going to be interesting because in 2020 we're probably going to see the deprecation of pod security policies within the project, and something's going to have to step up to replace that. And so I don't know that that's a fully uh, resolved question yet, and that's a big one. Like um, a lot of projects don't want to. A lot of uh, consumers don't want to adopt uh, security primitives that aren't core to a project like Kubernetes. And so to see that get step, you know, shipped out to a third party is interesting. Josh? I had, I had my answer, but then I lost it. I, I have one. I'm just wondering if like it's too nebulous, but I'm curious in 2020, how much we see people trying to abstract the Kubernetes API away from the people who actually deploy onto it versus how many people simply find good ways to expose it to their customers um, being like the people using their platform, whatever that may be. I feel like we've been in like this kind of back and forth with that concept for a while now, right? And it's super interesting as more and more work or more and more clusters are becoming production ready. I think that's a concept a lot of platform teams are thinking about. I don't think there's going to be one answer there. And I think uh, what I do hope, though, is that as people provide higher level experiences on top of Kubernetes, they don't try and hide the raw stuff altogether, right? It's, it becomes like sort of graduated thing so that, you know, if you hit a roadblock with the easy, easy mode, you can actually sort of like, you know, play it on more difficult mode to do what you need to do. Um, I think, you know, and I think that, you know, as long as we're moving in that direction, then all of a sudden we have sort of an ecosystem of things that can work together versus singular experiences that kind of try and wrap and hide Kubernetes completely. It's fair. Yeah, I, I think this this matches something that I've learned at uh, VMware over the last 10 years. Uh, every time that we decide to wrap something and uh, you know uh, hide the stuff underneath, there's so much innovation. You know, Maybe for six months, you, this, this is a good idea. And then suddenly everybody underneath innovates and you know, suddenly the wrapper is, is the thing that, that prevents you from using the value. So you know, for Kubernetes, I would expect the same, that if you do a good wrapper right now, two years from now, it's going to be terrible because it's going to hide all the good features. All right, yeah, I'll, I'll make a prediction. Um, so I, I agree with you, Christian. 
um, that if you try and wrap something, all of a sudden it grows until it actually exposes everything underneath it, right? <laughs> um, uh, my prediction is that the, uh, the, the OCI registry will actually grow to include storing more than container images. We're already starting to see this in some cases. But I think one people, once people realize that you can do more for storing large, storing and, and replicating and managing large data using the registry APIs and mechanisms, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to take off in other domains uh, beyond just container images. Things like data files for machine learning. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff happens when we have those capabilities applied to different application spaces. A little, little out there, but that's my prediction. And I think you're onto it. Anybody else have any wild wow predictions? Any like well, that? Maddie's asking like about that? topology aware routing. Uh, I think. The, the sort of the local routing of like hey when you hit a node go to the go to the service for that the 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 um, go to the pod for that service that's local I think that that's going to actually be you know uh, useful for load balancers that are Kubernetes aware um, the topology aware routing sort of as we look at sort of bigger larger topologies I think that that's a little bit of an advanced move and I think it's going to be um, um, I think, you know, users who are really trying to squeeze out the late, you know, the, the most out of it will probably use that, but I don't think it's going to be as super common for, for most users, at least early on. The topology stuff, I think, the other thing I'm always, I'm curious about is like, it feels like when you get into topology aware stuff, you're subdividing a fault domain in ways where you might just consider the fault domain to be the entire, the entity rather than, you know, try to figure out how to subdivide routing with some particular fault domain so that you have like different failure models for particular types of traffic, right? Like, like one of the topology models was the idea that you could actually keep traffic within an availability zone, even though the cluster um, is spread across multiple availability zones within a region, right? So you wouldn't have to pay that inter availability zone cost. And I'm like, but why not just have the cluster be in an availability zone and bundle the entire fault domain there? And so it, I think it's interesting. I think it's an interesting study in trying to figure out what the right line for that is. Oh, here's a good question. I'm going to throw this one at, at Nova. Joe says, any speculation around cluster API and the role it plays with a lot of the existing cluster provisioning lifecycle management tools? I mean, I think cluster API, like the whole point here was so that we could start to make it easy to integrate with other management tools. Like the whole API itself started from a conversation that we took directly from the QBAT and API. And so um, I think it's just gonna be like building out integrations and finding ways where we can start updating how we're describing the cluster API objects and then later enforcing those downstream. I'm really excited about seeing the cluster API in like a, an on-prem scenario and watching how we're solving, like dealing with node infrastructure at that level when you don't have something like a cloud where you can just pull it from by giving them credit for network. So I think it's just, it's gonna be cool to just watch, watch it grow. And we have two more t-shirt winners. Evan Anderson, who said someone promised me boring Kubernetes two well, years Evan's ago. Evan's a VMware employee. He already has a ton. Oh, is he? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he joined a couple weeks ago. Okay, sorry, Evan. You're gonna Welcome, Evan. <laughs> All right, sorry, Evan. Uh, all right, what about Suresh Vishnoi? Does he work for VMware also? I don't think so. If not, you want a, a Tanzu t-shirt, um, feel free to ping me here on Twitter or my email address. And I'll have extra t-shirts, so if, <coughs> if you've gotten something valuable out of TGIK, Mail me anyway, who knows? I might be in a good mood to send out way more t-shirts. So we definitely love to spread the love with that. Um, so do we want to close it up? Do we want an outro here? Does, does each yeah, one I think let's give close us, up. I think we give we, us we all like, Each of you give us a little closing comments and stuff. And then um, audience, feel free to, to you know share your little last tidbits there. And which how you've start? enjoyed our first 100 episodes. Right? Yeah, why don't you start? Uh, let's, start with, uh, let's start with you, George. Uh, I just, I appreciate everyone listening and helping out, especially those of you that help out uh, taking the notes and things like that. It just makes things a lot easier for us to spread the love and spread the tools and things like that. And as always, feel free to continue to interact with us on GitHub on things you'd want to see. 
All right, let's do Nova. Okay, I'm I'm fading fast here, folks. It's been a long day for me, but um, I I think the first thing I'd want to say is like thanks for letting me be a part of it, letting me come back and, and work with uh, with Duffy on the other episode we did, and just joining this. And you know, TGIK has helped me, and it's helped a lot of other people. So just a lot of gratitude here. Well, thank you for all much the time and effort and uh, you know heart and soul you've put into it. All right, Christian. Right, unmuting helps. Um, yeah, um, I. Uh, for me, it's uh, it's 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 a fun thing to do. Uh, I, I hope to be more on here. And uh, um, but yeah, beyond the technical content, I feel like this is this is a challenge. I know. Uh, I, I remember Joe, you, you said this um, uh, at KubeCon that uh, you know it's it's super taxing to do TJK and. Uh, uh, the, the first time I did it was super sweaty, so I'm, I'm <laughs> out of it. So uh, I, I hope it gets better. So I feel like this is a learning experience as well. So uh, you know, um, this is actually exciting uh, to do to do new format, and uh, yeah, looking forward to do more of that. All right, cool. We'll do uh, Duffy and then Josh, and then I'll close this out. Awesome. Thanks, thanks everybody. I say I put it in the post. I said you, yes, you, listening to my voice or reading in the chat or just watching this later. Um, thank you for being a part of this. I mean, like it's incredible. Like I'm, I'm really glad to be a part of it myself, and I'm really glad that you're here and you're the reason we're doing it. So keep being you. You know, like. <laughs> cool. And from me, thanks for an awesome 2019, everyone. Um, for the audience especially, thanks for being so welcoming to the newcomers uh, coming into TGIK. Like, it's pretty nerve wracking to like hop in front of a big audience and the feedback you get and everything is just so encouraging and amazing. So um, I'm looking forward to see what we all learn together in 2020. Yeah, well, I just wanna say, you know, thank you to the community. I think like, like Duffy says, every time we log on and we see folks from, you know, all over the world joining in, being part of it. That's super fun. And I think there's a lot of folks outside of, you know, that, that can't watch it live. And so when I go to conferences, when I run into people, there's, there's a lot of folks out there that, uh, you know, have been watched, binge watched it or, you know, watched it with their team. And I think that that's great. And so, and then beyond that, I mean, like, I love, you know, being able to turn it from, you know, just me to finding other folks who are sort of bringing their own take, their own flavor here. And so I definitely wanna find new ways to expand the sort of set of faces that we see online here. And I also think that like finding a ways to have it more be interactive versus just a single person um, is something that I want us to do do more of in the new year. So that's, uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. So here's uh, to a great, you know, 2020 and another 100 episodes and, you know, should be a, should be a good time. All right, thank you everybody. Have a great weekend if you're not already starting. Bye everyone. Take care everybody. Get well soon. Bye.